Welcome back, everybody. This is Nicole Naditz, your host for this series of interviews to bring to life the high leverage teaching practices for world language educators. I want to thank the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for their stewardship of this project, which includes not only these interviews, but later two webinars and a series of short TED Ed style courses. High leverage teaching practice three focuses on guiding learners to interpret and discuss authentic texts, meaning texts of all kinds, print, audio, video, and others, that were originally written by and for native speakers of the target language, not written to help non-native speakers learn the language. These texts do not have to be text in the literal sense. A photograph, a chart, a painting, a TV advertisement, a podcast, a menu, and more are all texts for the purposes of our work. Right. It is my pleasure to welcome two guests today who bring a great wealth of expertise in fostering students' ability to not only understand, but interact with authentic texts and use them as a springboard to further communication. Don Dola was the California Language Teacher of the Year in 2015. He has an MA in French and Francophone Studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is a National Board Certified Teacher and taught all levels of high school French in Northern California for 35 years before his retirement. He is currently co-director of the Berkeley World Language Project at UC Berkeley, a site of the California World Language Project, and he has been involved in that project for more than 25 years. His areas of expertise include project-based language learning, and teacher training and coaching. He loves to travel, do photography, and grow orchids for fun. And we're going to make sure we provide all of the ways you can reach him in information that you'll receive with this video. Stephen Chudy is a specialist in technology for language education at the University of Hawaii. Having taught Chinese for many years and co-authored a set of textbooks, Encounters Chinese Language and Culture, published by Yale University Press, he now specializes in professional development and educational design in the areas of blended and online learning, project-based language learning, micro-learning, workplace simulations, and the development of intercultural communicative competence. I wanna welcome both of you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Stephen and Don, before we begin exploring the strategies to engage learners in interacting with authentic texts, it's important to talk about selecting texts for our learners. Don, what are some key considerations that guide you when searching for and selecting texts? Okay, well, when searching for authentic resources, I like to look for all kinds of multimedia documents that go along with the themes of the units that I'm I'm working with my students about. I typically save these things in Digo um, for later use. I'm, I tab, tag them so I can sort and so on. And I keep in mind the uh, various purposes for those resources. I always, I was looking for cultural as well as linguistic content. Um, and perhaps also for rhetorical purposes. I want to hear authentic voice and so on. Um, so, I like to address various text types as well. I want to ensure my students are interacting with things like fiction, nonfiction, current events, historical documents. And I always like to bear in mind that I want my students to engage with these documents. So I ask whether the resources are likely to be interesting to my students. I have teens and so I pick things that they're interested in. And if not, they don't appeal to them, and it's not going to, they're not going to dig in deeply with the documents. That's absolutely true. And Stephen, is there anything you would like to add? Sure. Don just mentioned text types, and we can understand that term in several different ways. So there are uh, documents that, that serve different purposes for their readers. Some are informative, some are persuasive, uh, but there are other uh, dimensions to that. For example, some documents could be said to be at the word level, like a shopping list. Some are more at the sentence level, like a recipe. And then some are at the paragraph level, like a simple news report. And then as you push upward, of course, you find more persuasive documents. And not only does the communicative function change, but also the length of the sentences, all the everything 
is sort of bundled together and becomes more and more sophisticated. So you can think about those things separately or together when you're selecting an authentic text. Um, so not just focusing on the vocabulary or the syntax that you see in the document, but a more holistic view of, of its complexity. Um, so, but even though we want to select that document preferably in line with what it was originally intended for, it, that might not always be the case. Sometimes we select a document that we want to use for what we might call a meta-linguistic purpose, like having learners hunt for particular verb forms or say in Chinese, identifying specific radicals. Um, I might even give low level learners a very sophisticated text to do those things with because in that case, that's not the authentic use of the text that's in the other one. So it, it sort of goes to show. So, so if I'm doing that kind of thing, I'm actually not engaging in this high leverage teaching practice because HLGP3, the uh, discussing, sorry, interpreting and discussing authentic texts requires that you, you align uh, your chain of activities with the, that purpose of the original text. Yeah. I really like that clarification that the simple act of selecting an authentic text and bringing it to our students does not necessarily mean that we are actually really enacting this particular high leverage teaching practice. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, Stephen, we're going to spend the first part of the interview looking at how to guide learners to interpret authentic texts in the way outlined by this high leverage teaching practice. So first of all, Continue a little bit talking about some of your favorite types of texts to use, especially with novice learners. Well, novice learners deal with, uh, sim well, they don't even deal with, they try to deal with simple survival situations. Uh, and their text type in terms of uh, length of text is word or phrase. Um, so uh, think, Texts, authentic texts that naturally occur at that word level are our best match. So I already mentioned shopping lists. Uh, I think the next natural progression we're going to find are interpersonal texts because those are so like texts that you send on your phone because they're naturally very short in length typically. Uh, and easier for the learner to structure what they're seeing as they go back and forth between two people and, and that, that aids their understanding. Um, one additional aspect of, the, of simple texts is texts that are highly visually structured. Uh, for example, they have tabulated information or an infographic that has different parts of the information visually supported than that, that helps the learner understand. So those are my favorites. And I think as well that those texts tend to represent, those types of texts tend to represent the kinds of documents that these students encounter in their normal daily experiences. For example, when you, when you mentioned sending texts um, or some of the kinds of lists and things that have chunks of language. And so that too would really support the novice language learner. Once you have selected a text, what sequence of activities do you find to be successful at fostering learners' interpretive proficiency? Well, in the ideal situation, when I've done my text selection, I will have selected at least two texts that differ in some important aspect. For example, you might have someone whose personal preferences don't match at all with the personal preferences of the author of the other text. So you're having the students, uh, you, you're presenting the students with this range of information that they will use to either decide that they agree with one person more than the other or make some, some decision that is based on the, the evidence in the text for them to, to cite when they explain why, you know, like I'm not like this person, I'm like that person. So, it's that initial array of having two different texts for comparison that helps me uh, do those things a lot. 
Well, and that makes a lot of sense because compare and contrast strategies are among those that we know foster students' literacy, not just in our world languages, but in other subject areas as well. Mm -hmm. What are some different types of questions or activities that you use to both gauge and also deepen your learner's understanding of text? text comes to us and uh, you know since we've had so much exposure to traditional teaching practices we sometimes tend to look only at the surface of the text and see what language forms are available for my learners here but uh, I think it's useful in the context of HLTP3 uh, to step back and say let's use some tools from textual criticism who is the author of this text what is the purpose of their writing the text and for whom did they write the text author audience and purpose those can be the starting point for us to develop activities of course the simple you know uh, who wrote this the, the whole questions come to mind but those aren't the only things that that we can do um, and as far as deepening um, you can you can do different depths of of, uh, of those questions like who wrote this text might be as simple as a name or a name and a title, but, but on a deeper level, it's the reason the person wrote that text, produced that text was to accomplish some larger uh, purpose in the world and they represent a certain standing in the world. You, if you inquire into that, then you're getting into that, the deeper inquiry that, that you're talking about. Who did they want to see the text? Are they trying to persuade? Or are they simply trying to give someone instructions? Um, those kind of things. Right, and so given all of that, are there certain question types or even activity types that you feel are potentially particularly underutilized? I think the one word answer to that is scaffolding. So I just mentioned that we might ask those sort of open-ended type questions about the text. But if we're dealing with novice learners, they're not going to be able to formulate uh, an entire response to that. So then, uh, instead of thinking about asking the learners to produce a lot in the target language to process the meaning of the text, I tried to create a container for them to transfer information from the text into that container without having to pass through articulating their answer entirely in the target language. And that container, which might be, say, a worksheet, could be, uh, a tr it could represent a way that they can take the information from the text and transform it into a different form, say, a more visual form, or filling information in on a chart where, or a table where it wasn't that way in the original uh, text. Um, so essentially what I'm doing is supporting or scaffolding the learner. So I'm doing that either by providing an organizer for the information, or I might even be doing part of the task for them, like answering most of the question, but leaving one little space uh, for them as novice learners so that they can do, you know, that, that much. Absolutely. It's like the, in some other subjects, they call it using sentence frames in order to support learners with limited language proficiency to be able to demonstrate their knowledge. Yes. As well as, of course, the broader use of graphic organizers. Yes. So if we talk about sentence frames or sentence stems, that actually represents scaffold in more than one sense. It's scaffolding in that you are helping support the student, but it's also scaffolding enabling them to climb higher so that they, the language that is there, they can rely on it. Let's say they have to turn around and produce rather than just engaging in this interpretive task. If they need to turn around and produce, that language is sitting right there for them to grab and, and use. And they're sort of imitating a higher level of proficiency than they actually have. And through a practice effect, that language may sort of become you know, absorbed. Right, as they have more opportunities to do that, it actually becomes part of them. Um, before we turn this over to Dawn, I have one last question for you. And that was, can you share your thoughts regarding the use of English when checking students' comprehension of a, of a text? I'm sure we've all heard of the uh, sort of the best practice espoused. Uh, it's embodied in the very, you know, uh, in actual descriptions that 
uh, teachers should strive to use target language 90% of the time and not exceed 10% of uh, first language use in the classroom. So that being said, um, essentially you're faced with uh, a, a strategic decision. If your determination to use the target language at all costs leads you to a place where the students are frustrated, trying to understand, and they can't, and you could cut through the, the problem by using a, you know, a small amount of the, of the first language, why not go ahead and do it? On the other hand, uh, if, if you're such a strategic thinker, maybe there are some ways that you could, by using the kind of scaffolding that I described, point to you know the answer that you want from them without going by a you know complicated production mm -hmm. i know that i like to also remind teachers that uh sometimes they have to be cautious what it is they're actually assessing with their question because sometimes if it's in the target language then they end up assessing their students comprehension of the question rather than of the text or depending on the way in which they're asking students to respond they're pulling the writing in as well and that's fine as long as the teacher understands that that is what they're doing and also what they're ultimately going to be looking at but in case the teacher does not want to do that then go back to your hierarchy of questions first kind of question is yes no or mm -hmm. choice type question and, right. and building up from there now yeah and the either or and the what is it you know filling in kind of the blank as you were saying earlier so that they have what they need in order to participate successfully yeah. So Don, before we talk about text-based discussions, do you have any quick thoughts you would like to add to regarding the selection of authentic texts or the sequence of activities or anything we've talked about so far today? Well, while Stephen was talking, I affirm everything he said, by the way. Uh, thanks, Stephen. So good. Um, I, I like, you know, we, I often teach thematic units, and we do that for the reason that it establishes a broad context for the communication that we're having our students learn how to do. To do. So when I want to situ, I want to situate my authentic resources in that context of that thematic unit, it's so that it's connected to the kinds of things Stephen was mentioning, uh, situating the document in its cultural context. So I'm picking themes that are culturally relevant because ultimately we don't want just kids to, to look at text. We also want them to see the various cultural perspectives that are in, in the text themselves or referred to um, the practices, the products, and the perspectives as we talk about. And when we do that, it gives students more opportunity to develop their, a deeper comprehension, not just of the language, but also of the culture. We connect it to prior knowledge. Um, we have students relate new learning to previously learned content so that they have a place to pin to, we call that schema, right? And we talk about using schema to to help students pin new learning to the prior learning. Uh, so we wanna make sure they have that, that connection. Uh, and when we help students acquire this new knowledge in that way, they gain greater confidence to be able to um, perform new tasks. So we also help them grow in that inner cultural competency that's so important we've been talking about a lot lately. So as students study authentic resources, they observe viewpoints of those within the culture and they can develop deeper insights into the ways people in other cultures view themselves and their and their world. Absolutely. I really appreciate you pulling in the interculturality piece. It is a really important and critical reason why we use authentic materials and want to be drawn to those. That is something that they bring into the learning experiences that publisher created materials or most teacher created materials just can't do. Um, by just by the nature of their being authentic. And we know that language and culture are inexorably linked. So we need to see language used in its authentic cultural contexts. We're gonna shift our focus now to the importance of text-based discussions. Yeah. So Don, tell us a little bit about why text-based discussions are fundamental for our learners. So text-based discussions offer our students the opportunity to take what they 
understand about an authentic text, whatever format it's in, audio, video, visual, and so on, written, all the ways we've talked about before, to, to create deeper meaning through collaboration with other um, second language learners, uh, sharing their inferences, uh, ideas, opinions, and so on. Um, in the interpersonal communication mode, for example, uh, students discuss, right, learning, using spontaneous language, um, what they understand and what they think about the text, or perhaps better said, what they think they understand, so they can, they can test those hypotheses, right, about the text in question. So it's important to encourage our students to, to justify their statements and opinions by citing the text to support what they're stating. Um, we want them to have uh, the opportunity to, have to, to do that in, in the community of, of learning that we have. So once students have, uh, teachers have established their students' comprehension, um, we can go further, right? So we want them to have that opportunity. Absolutely, and bringing in that sense of that spontaneous conversation, it's one of the areas that I think a lot of teachers want to work even more on intentionally providing opportunities for, for our learners, because that really is the nature of how they're going to communicate with other target language speakers outside right. of our rooms. Yeah. So we want to foster as many opportunities to do that as possible. And um, how do you recommend supporting learners to engage in those spontaneous target language conversations that are informed and inspired by these authentic materials? Well, that's a great question. So um, there's several, several strategies a teacher can use to, to, um, and to keep in mind when offering students the opportunity to engage in these text-based discussions. So first, activate that prior knowledge establishes a framework of understanding that allows the students to connect new learning to previous learning, like we talked about that schema that's there. Um, it, uh, it includes that the new information they're acquiring and viewing and listening uh, and so on connects to the discussion as well. Um, I think it's important to scaffold comprehension of the authentic resources with pre-reading activities like what do we know? What do we need to know? For example, coming out of project-based learning or skimming and scanning or predicting based on what they can see. Maybe there are visuals on the text. They can sort of predict what this is about. Um, uh, another thing, uh, uh, reading comprehension activities. For example, using guy, uh, graphic organizers, T-charts or four quadrant um, organizers with labels so that they can cull out pieces of information and, and organize them in a visual manner on paper, maybe Venn diagrams, or uh, also focused or guided guessing questions. Just guessing at things is an important skill for language learners. We do a lot of guessing when we're at that novice level in particular. It's really important that they, the students have the opportunity to practice guessing and get confident with it and feel like uh, it's okay if they guess and even if they make mistakes. Doesn't matter, they're, they're, they're taking that, that step and learning to be comfortable with it. Um, also, there's post-reading post activities. Once, once we've gone through it, uh, the text-based discussion options um, we're about to explore, there's, there's opportunities for them to further their, their notice. Their, uh, their, their thoughts and ideas. I like to encourage students to keep what I call a, a second language album. And, and I just had them get those little composition books and taught them to be collectors of words like stamp collectors collect stamps, basically. And uh, we also have a word wall in the room where we put up post-its of new words and new phrases or charts with sentence frames and, and, uh, and sentence starters. And I just leave them up. I don't care if it's during the test, I, they still have to know how to use them. So we just keep them there. And the, ki the kids, they refer to that and the fact that they see it often and frequently, um, and it gives them greater confidence to, to take some risks in communicating. 
Students can add to it. They're post-its in their little baskets on the tables and they can use those post-its to add the words that they want. So if they have that ownership for it, I'm wanting them to engage in their own learning deeply. So it's not just the teacher adding to the wall, it's the students who can do that too. And we just leave it up. If things get covered up at the end of the year, we, we all help take it down and prepare for the new year. And I don't care if the, the things that go on the wall are, um, are completely right. If they put them up, I can monitor and adjust that. And maybe I slip in a new note with, I try to mimic their, their, uh, their handwriting a little bit so it still looks like their own, but I'll correct it a little bit after class, you know? But I'm, I'm keen to see them participating in the development. They take a lot of pride in it. Um, and as far as uh, the words on the wall, they're all in, uh, in my case, I taught French, so all the words, all the phrases, everything's in French. Um, in their in their little word albums, they can write whatever they want. That's fine. But the what's on the wall, I want it to be in target language, and it's been great. Um, so and in terms of use of second language, I, I, Steve and I are totally on the same page with that. I, I almost always, me personally, I always speak in French, even if it's questioning students, uh, I'm, because I feel like I'm modeling for them the ways to, to, to have those discussions. If they go into their home language for a moment, then I give back to them what they're trying to say in French to model that. Um, but I stay in French even if they occasionally slip into their home language, but I expect them to do it in French. Uh, especially the further along they go, the more they go, they, the more they expect it. Yeah. So there's a few thoughts there to get yeah. us. And that was absolutely my case as well, um, teaching French also. Yeah. Uh, everything that I communicated to my students was in French. If they're doing, I know some people are familiar with the um, nine kind of activities proposed in a template that Actful has for um, interpretive tasks. Yeah. Those things they do on their own independently. Um, but as far as when we are discussing authentic texts in class, that happens in the target language. And I want to highlight, too, a, a couple of things that you said. Um, I really like, for me, too, like the predicting strategies are critically yeah. important. They're actually shown in literature to be one of the best things we can do to help boost students' yes. literacy. And we also need to recognize that our learners, one, the one advantage many of our students have if they're in a traditional high school program rather than dual immersion starting in elementary school is that they bring with them life experience and we need to help them bring that to bear. Um, and then um, when you are, you are also talking about guessing meaningful context and I really feel like students need more opportunities to do that than they have in many classes because the fact of the matter is they are never going to know all the words and they are constantly going to be confronted with needing to navigate the context in which the word is situated in order to decide what to do or what it means right um, and i love word walls also because that helped remind me and my students to keep using those words so then it became part of our kind of communal vocabulary that we own yeah. and, and becomes something they can use independently exactly so what expressions or strategies do you teach students so that they are empowered to engage in normal conversational skills, such as interrupting, taking the floor, agreeing, disagreeing, clarifying meaning? Sometimes we call those gambits. Um, and so they're just they're strategies that are really important to give to students so that they do know how. It doesn't come naturally. It's not very often in our comprehensible input stories that we come across these phrases. So I think it's really important to help students um, have those natural kinds of conversations with, with, I give them handouts, but I very often make those handouts into charts or posters to put up on the wall um, that have sentence starters or phrases, and I organize them by language functions. So I'll say, you know, to take the floor, but I say it in French, you know, I don't say it that way, but, you know, pour prendre la parole, you know, to take the word, as we say, right? Here are 
uh, three or four choices, okay? To disagree, here are some choices. To agree and add, all right? Uh, you know, while I, while I agree with so-and-so about A, on the other hand, I, and you come up with a, a, several kinds of these things. You know who is very, very good with this is Kate Kinsella. If you do a Google search for Kate Kinsella and you'll find a ton of uh, things that she's put together that are very helpful and we can very easily translate those into our target languages and use them. Those gambits are very helpful. And if you're searching for Kate Kinsella, that's with a K for both Kate yes. and for Kinsella. And I know I used to do almost like a placemat style thing that I copied yeah. my students and it included everything you said and like you probably do as well. I had ways to kind of encourage someone yes. who was talking and, and help them feel confident and comfortable and yeah. Yeah, but according to those language functions so that they realize what they're trying to do, I think it's really helpful to organize them that way. Yes. And yeah, I had them put them in their collection, their albums, as well as um, things on the table. And of course, always, always, always on the wall. Yeah. We want to make sure that our learners aren't struggling to find their resources. I don't want to make a yeah. battle out of whether or not they have their things with them that day. Not worth it. That's not the point. The point is that they have what they need when they need it. So yeah. I agree with you 100%. I'm more than happy to give them five different ways to access those same resources, one of which is just, it's in my room in case exactly. you don't um, what logistical suggestions do you have for teachers who might be facilitating these kinds of text-based discussions for the first time? Well, I think it's important to help the students feel really comfortable. So setting the room up for the discussion, making it possible for the chairs to go in a circle where everyone can see each other's faces is really helpful. So I had the pleasure of having wheelie chairs and so chairs with wheels and tables that had wheels so we could easily just uh, unlock the, the legs and push the tables aside and everybody gets into a circle. Um, and the kids love helping with that and they're quick about putting them away too because they enjoy the interpersonal communication that we're doing. Especially if we've really got a theme that they love. I mean, that's the big thing. It's like you pick these authentic resources, the theme that totally engages them. You want to talk about music, pick music they know and introduce similar things from the target language and then organize this conversation about these pop stars they like and so on. Um, also, um, I start with simple questions and build toward more complex ones. Get them Rela uh, relaxed and engaged where they are safe and comfortable and willing to take risks and then ratchet it up a little bit at a time. So get the conversation started. I might start by saying a couple things and then asking the questions, what about you? What do you think? And, um, and encouraging those efforts. And if they, they make a mistake, who cares? As long as we understand them, that's fine. Um, I do serve as a facilitator of a conversation, so my prep ahead of time is to write out a ton of, card, of questions on a card just for myself. Um, I'm ready and available to add assistance, but I encourage the students to take over the conversation and try to step back as quick as possible. Um, I kind of keep, um, I record some points to support further comments by students. Um, uh, in other words, discussion points, I mean, not necessarily, points for participating, that's a whole nother question, but I, I have some points um, to help support that conversation, to prompt and say, well, what about this or what about that? Um, and I, I also encourage the students to encourage each other. Um, it's one thing when the teacher says, hey, I really enjoy that comment, but I like it when the students say, oh, I agree with you, I really like that. Even those short little phrases of that kind, it's normal, natural, everyday type language. People do that. And so I, I want the students to do that part. Um, so, and then I think it's important to have some group norms or agreements. And I, I was big about classroom agreements that we hold together, that we all agree. And I have to also keep the agreements. 
And so we all own our learning space, all of us together. So we have some you know, norms that we hold each other accountable to. If I make the mistake, the students can ask me, are you keeping our agreements? And if I'm not, I have to apologize, just like I expect from them. They find that fair and appropriate, and we set those agreements together on the first day of school. And of course, we do it in target language. So everyone, everyone holds the, the learning space together. They own the classroom just as much as I do. It's, it's maybe where I'm based, but they, and they come and go, but when they come in that room, They've entered into our collective community for learning in the target language. So I think it's really important. I found kids to be really responsible uh, when they own the ways that we agree to learn together. That has a big effect on these kinds of discussions. Absolutely. And I know, too, the importance of the learning, the physical learning environment. It turns out that rows of desks don't really promote no, exactly. interaction. Right. And it, it's coming around in the field. I'm seeing a lot more use of flexible seating. Starting yes. easier one if you have to do what I did. I didn't have a budget for the awesome wheelie chairs and tables, but I was able to at least get tables. Um, and that made a huge difference because it supported the environment I wanted to do and set the tone for conversation and communication as the focus of our class. Exactly. Um, Stephen, did you have any final thoughts you would like to add? Well, it's all wonderful. Um, I was just reflecting that what you're talking about is the building of a classroom culture. Yes. And um, for teachers who find themselves at the beginning of that process, they need to be gentle with themselves and tell themselves that they might do some belly flops before they get their class into that sort of humming uh, hive of discussion that we, we want so much. And some of the ways that they can do that are by heavily scaffolding that those group norms, that group interaction. You might even start with a talking stick, mm -hmm. um, something like that, where not only does the person who has the stick has the only authority to talk, but also when the, path, when the stick gets passed to you, you're expected to say something. Uh, even if on the class cheat sheet there is a box that says I have nothing to say you've got to say that in the target language at a minimum so so um, starting with you know baby steps like that I think that's the only thing I had to add everything else was music to my ears <laughs> well thank you so much and I, I follow up with that just to remind all of our listeners if you're listening to these interviews and hearing something that you'd really like to try, we have to actually remember that the first time we try to implement any new strategy, the research says it's going to probably go a little bit more difficultly than you expected. And you have to give yourselves permission, just like we give our learners permission to reflect on that and not give up on it immediately, but rather say, what is it that needed to be changed? How can I make this better in a, in a next attempt for my learners and give ourselves at least three times with a new strategy before we just automatically say, oh wait, no, there's no way I'm gonna do that. And don't take off more than you can chew, right? Yeah. Try, try one thing, get yeah. really good at it, and then, and when you're really comfortable with it, then add one more thing. Absolutely, we need yeah. to give ourselves permission to grow incrementally. We're not gonna jump on a continuum yes. from one level all the way across three other levels. That's not, that's not something we can expect ourselves to do. Yeah. So I want to thank you both, Don and Stephen, for joining us today and for really sharing with us your expertise related to this high leverage teaching practice. And I hope that all of our listeners will join us again for our next interview on high leverage teaching practice number four.